All right, I'm, I'm here to give the like fun history lesson and talk a little bit about where Zcash came from. Um, just to, to give you guys, let me see if I can make this work. Uh, just to give you a little background about who I am, um, I teach at Johns Hopkins University. I'm a professor of cryptography. I work in applied crypto, which is mostly you know, making encryption work, messaging systems, and TLS. But one of the things that I've really always loved is working on privacy. And I think that's what makes crypto so interesting, is the idea that we can do things that you can't do with normal computers, like private payments and all sorts of other stuff like that. Um, and I'm also one of the seven scientists, I'm going to show you pictures of the rest of them, who actually uh, invented the zero cash protocol that Zcash is, is based on. Um, this is a picture of the rest of the guys. This is Madars, Ali, uh, Ian, uh, Iran, Eli, and Christina. Some of them are here. You'll probably meet them later today, but I figured I should, I should give them some credit too. Um, one of the things I want to sort of talk about is where this all came from for me. So I am a professor, but I have two kind of main sources of inspiration, things that actually got me into this field, and they're embarrassing to talk about, and like it's not cool to go to like professor parties and say this stuff, but <laughs> the two things that really got me excited about crypto were one, reading Bruce Schneier's applied cryptography book page by page on the train going back and forth to work and learning about all the ridiculous things like all of which are now broken. We should never use them, but it was an amazing book and it taught me what crypto could do. And the second thing that really got me into this field was this, this fiction book, Cryptonomicon, which is, uh, if you've all read it, I hope some of you have read it, is a, is a story about a bunch of guys uh, guys and girls traveling around the world and having like absurdly cool adventures while starting a private cryptocurrency. And one of the things I learned in being involved in Zcash is that literally none of that is true. Like there is no adventure, there is no excitement, it's really just sitting around a lot and talking to people about code and, and algorithms. Um, so I want to start, before I go on and talk about Zcash and maybe the future of Zcash, I want to talk a little bit about the past. And specifically, I want to go way, way, way back into like prehistory. I want to go back to the 1980s and maybe around that time. Okay. So before Bitcoin, before we had decentralized currencies, we had some technology that was trying to do interesting things related to privacy, related to payments. Uh, we've always had electronic payments, or at least since we had computers, we've had electronic payments. But what was interesting is back in the 80s, a bunch of really, really smart cryptographers said, you know what, these computers are gonna be a big problem. They're gonna reveal all sorts of information about what we do with our money, with our lives, and we need to do something about this. We need to use this technology against itself to give us privacy. And one of those people was a guy named David Chom, who invented something that he called eCash. And so the idea of eCash is super simple. You have these coins, should sound familiar, and you can get these coins, and you can spend these coins, and nobody can tell to whom you're spending, or who you are, or where the coins are going. And it's a brilliant idea. It allows you to do these amazing things that you can't do with normal cash. Um, and it basically solves you know, all the privacy problems. It still has some problems with double spending and so on. But these things were all problems people thought about. I'll show you a picture of Chom's paper. This is my, my interpretation of Chom's paper from 1983. And you don't have to worry about the details of it very much. But the thing you should notice is the thing that box on, for me, the right side of the screen, that bank. All of these schemes, from 1983 up to maybe 2007, every single one of these schemes relied on the idea that you're going to have a trusted party, and that trusted party was going to do stuff for you, and it was a lot of stuff. And as a result of that trusted party, I think you could pretty much draw a direct line between the failure of eCash as a successful technology and, and that trusted party existing. And the reason is that having trusted party, having banks, sucks. It sucks because you can't get things off the ground if you have to trust somebody. So let me be more specific. If you look at what happened to DigiCash, all of these systems required trusted servers that would issue money. In 1994, the EU stepped in and said, basically, you can't do this. Real banks have to be involved. In, uh, after 9-11, it became almost impossible to envision a privacy-preserving currency of any kind because even non-anonymous currencies like e-gold and Liberty Reserve were getting shut down and people were kicking in doors and so on. Now they were doing shady things, but it didn't matter whether you're doing shady things. If anyone used your system anywhere to do something, you would basically have your system shut down. And so the question is, were these technical failures or were they policy failures? Maybe it doesn't matter. They were both, right? The technology needs to work within the policies that we have, and if this is the way it has to work, then, then you know, it's not gonna work at all. Okay, so moving forward, 
What did we get out of this prehistory era, the 1980s? Did we get privacy-preserving currency? No, we got PayPal. And we got PayPal, and the good part about getting PayPal is, you know, we got Elon Musk, you know, we get rockets, and the bad part is we got Elon Musk, and we get Elon Musk tweeting. So there's a lot of sort of ups and downs about that, but we got some stuff out of it. Okay, so moving forward, right, sorry, I, I promised you this wouldn't be a long history lesson. Moving forward to 2008, we get to this kind of new era where something changes. And what changes is Bitcoin. Now, people had thought about the ideas behind decentralizing currencies before, but nobody had built it. And Nakamoto came along and said, hey, you know what, let's introduce this new consensus algorithm. Let's use it to build a ledger, but that ledger won't be run by one party. It'll be run by everybody, and we'll make this work. And, and amazingly, he did it. He released code, and the whole thing actually ran, which nobody expected. I didn't expect. Everybody thought it would break down, and it didn't. So great. What's the matter with Bitcoin? Have we solved the problem? Well, as researchers, you know, the first thing we do when we look at a new system is we say, how does it suck? How is it broken? And so my grad students and I, and Ian is here, he's one of them, looked at this system, we couldn't find a problem with it. But we found one thing we didn't like, and that was the fact that unlike all these previous eCash systems, it provided no privacy whatsoever. In fact, it was worse than having banking systems because all of a sudden all of your transactions went from just being known to a bank to being known to the whole world. And this is totally unacceptable. It's unacceptable for a lot of reasons. The reason is, of course, this is a pretty old graph. This is an example of what happens to you. When you use something like, I think Silk Road is that big uh, red dot in the middle of that graph. When you go around spending your money on things like Silk Road, and then you go and you donate to people, and you go and you spend uh, to other people, you're linking all your transactions. I hope I don't need to tell this audience what happens when you have a completely non-private linkable currency. It can be really bad. The worst story I heard recently is actually one of the Zcash um, community developers had a situation where they received a donation and a bunch of scammers saw that donation. It was not on Zcash, it was I think on another currency. They saw that donation and they basically extorted this person because they thought that they were rich. They misinterpreted a change address for being the actual donation address. So having public information can be dangerous to your health. You don't want to do that. Okay, there's another reason you should not want this. And I don't know if many people saw this. It was in the papers a little while ago. Uh, this is a program by the NSA that was revealed in the Snowden documents called Monkey Rocket. Monkey Rocket is my favorite name out of the Snowden documents. I'm sorry this is so, so, so long that for it to come out. Basically, the NSA set up private VPNs that they ran that looked like real VPNs. And they got a whole bunch of people to connect through those VPNs and to do Bitcoin transactions. And then they basically de-anonymized the crap out of them. They even got information, including MAC addresses, on local computers because I assume they must have shipped a custom client. So again, some of these people were bad people, some of these were good people, but the point is everything they did was now recorded by somebody who was being very dishonest because they were operating this, this service and not being clear about what it was supposed to do. So the idea that my students and I came up with, or at least we thought about uh, a bunch of different solutions, was this thing originally called Zero Coin. And um, the name Zero Coin has been a name that we regretted for a long time because um, it, it doesn't sound so great. But roughly speaking, the idea of Zero Coin was to use zero knowledge proofs to do something really simple, right? The simple thing was you could go on a ledger, and if you wanted to, you could mix your currency with other people's currencies. You could say, I have a Bitcoin. I want to put a Bitcoin on the ledger in such a way that it's there. That's the envelope on the left side. And later on, I can redeem that, zero, that Bitcoin for one of a huge collection of pooled mixed Bitcoins and get it back, and nobody will be able to link the, the push of the original coin to the redemption that happens later. And this was all done using a fairly obnoxious zero-knowledge proof technology. And here I'm going to just skip past all the details of this and point you to that bottom box. In order to make this work, we required a zero-knowledge double discrete log proof that was 25 kilobytes large and required like 10 seconds or something ridiculous to verify. And because we were academics and because we were naive, we went to the Bitcoin developers and we said, this is awesome. Will you guys put this in Bitcoin? And they were like, you're really nice people, and they were super nice to us. And then they like gently like let us down and told us this was never, ever going to happen, and it needed to be faster. There was just no way this was going to work. And it was great. Like These guys were so nice, and they made us go back and improve it. And so before I get to how we improved it, I want to just point out kind of one thing that happened next, which is that we released our source code. And the lesson I learned from that is never, ever release your source code. Because what happened is people went and they implemented ZeroCoin in real currencies 
uh, one of which got hacked, not because of us, mostly, and it resulted in a 370,000 zero coin theft, which was like $600,000, and of course, the price of that currency went up by 3% afterwards, which makes no sense to me. Um, I claim this was not our fault, and the best part about this attack was that we had put this warning on our code, which said, seriously, do not use it. The people who took our code to implement that coin actually copied this warning verbatim into their own code and then shipped a production coin. So there's, there's a good side of de de deploying software and there's a bad side. There are risks too. All right. So ZeroCoin was fun. It was a good first approach. It showed us this could work. We implemented it. It just wasn't efficient enough. And it had some limitations too. Every coin had the same value. You couldn't have variable values or do actual payments. And so the next thing was, how do we make this better? We got very lucky because at the same conference we were presenting ZeroCoin at, we ran into this team of folks uh, and they were, they were building a new and very efficient zero knowledge proving technology called ZK Snarks. And these are the folks, Ali, Madars, uh, Eli, Iran, and um, I guess that's it, those four. So we ran into them and we said, let's build an actual system, a system that is much more efficient and does things that, that, that ZeroCoin couldn't do. And the technique that we used, basically, what, what you should know about snarks, and I think many of you do if you're here, is that they allow you to prove a statement, but they allow you to do it very, very efficiently. You can prove a statement with a proof that is bandwidth cost about 288 bytes or maybe a few hundred bytes. This is, these are some slightly old numbers. And they can be verified very efficiently. They're succinct. The proving is a little costly, but it's still, still much faster than what we had in ZeroCoin. And there were even C compilers. So we could just go out and like write up our code in C we could compile it and we'd have a zero knowledge proof technology for a, for a, a private currency. But we didn't do that because it wasn't efficient enough. So we started from scratch, this is the boring part, we actually developed a new construction using custom circuits based on SHA-256. We modified the zero coin approach, we added a lot of stuff, we hand optimized, came up with a much more efficient thing, that was zero cash. And then the other thing is, I'm gonna skip forward, the other thing we figured out we could do is we could add values to coins, so you could split and you could merge coins. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this, but you could do all the things that you could do with Zcash today, and it's really neat that you can do this without the need for a base currency, at least hypothetically. Okay, um, I'm gonna come back. One more thing I wanna just point out. This is the actual original Zcash, uh, zero cash, tree, this is the structure. Zcash implements almost all of this in Sprout. There are a few details that are different, so it's like inspired by, it's not exactly the same protocol, but it is still fundamentally the protocol that we came up with back then. S uh, sapling is a whole nother thing. Sapling is awesome, but I'm not gonna steal anyone's thunder on, on how that works. Okay. So, how much time do I have here? Um, the next thing that happened to us is we thought, well, we're done, we're academics, we can move on to the next academic project. But we didn't want to because we thought this was awesome and we wanted it to exist and we wanted people to be able to actually use privacy preserving currencies. And suddenly we're in this decentralized era where you can write code and people will use it as we saw with ZeroCoin. But we wanted somebody who was actually competent enough to lead a company and drive it and would actually inspire people to do things around this, this currency. And that's when I started talking to Zuko about it. And we had this very long kind of discussion where Zuko said, you're absolutely crazy. I don't think this is a good idea. Like privacy preserving currencies are not a good idea. And he went back and he thought about it. He said, you know what? Actually, fungibility and privacy are both really essential to currencies. You need these. He came back and we decided, uh, he decided to build this company and we decided to be his advisors. And I had this completely insane experience traveling out to Silicon Valley with him where we would go to people asking for money to start this company and they would say, this is the worst idea we've ever heard. Like, why would we possibly give you any money? Also, here's 100,000 bucks. And we didn't need that many people, so we just kept doing this over and over again until we had funded the entire company. It was, it was a really cool experience, except for the people uh, at Kleiner Perkins who said, you guys are nuts, there's no future for this, this blockchain stuff is gonna die, and they kicked us, more or less, very politely out of their office. Um, I don't know what they're doing now. I, I hear, um, hear their funding some stuff. Okay, so I wanna, I wanna skip on. I don't know where I'm doing, how I'm doing on time, but I'm, I'm about to, to finish up. Oh good, I'm getting the almost done sign. All right, so I wanna talk about the future. So you are gonna hear a lot about sap, uh, Sprout, sorry, Sapling. You're gonna hear a lot about Sapling in the next few days. And Sapling is super neat. Sapling is efficient. Sapling is basically the same construction as ZeroCash, as Zcash, a Sprout, but it's much, much more efficient. It'll bring proving times down to Maybe a second or two, I don't have the latest numbers, but it's going to be very fast, it's gonna be neat, and it's great. 
I want to talk about where we could go beyond that. So there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in this community for Zcash to pick up. And I should mention also that I'm a foundation board member. And so when I talk about what's interesting in privacy, I get the benefit of not having to focus entirely on the Zcash currency. I can talk about what the entire community could use as well. And so for me, when I look at the things that are out there today, I see this really neat technology that's just too hard to use. And even though I love fancy crypto and I want to sit here and talk to you about ZK snarks and about trustless proofs and all these things, I also just want to be able to take out my phone and make anonymous transactions to people. And so for me, this kind of stuff is low-hanging fruit that we've got to hit. We've got to do it. Even if it doesn't excite us, it excites me, but even if it doesn't excite us, it, it has to be something we work on. There's other stuff. So light wallets is actually a hard problem. We have to keep anonymity from a server. Payment channels are interesting to me. We have to be able to do scalability at some kind of L2. I don't know if that's the solution to scalability, but it's one possibility. Okay? The next thing we need to think about is how do we make these proofs better? There is a huge amount of proving technology, zero knowledge proof technology coming out. Uh, there are ZK Starks, there are bullet proofs. There are things that we haven't even seen yet that are gonna pop out of academic conferences over the next two years. We need to stay on top of that. I'm convinced that right now ZK Snarks are still the right technology, but maybe in five years they won't be, and I don't want to be caught by surprise. Fundamentally, we shouldn't care. These are tools. We pick the right tools for the job, we use them, we build them into our system. So we need to stay on top of that and make sure we're using the right tools. There are a lot of things we can do beyond that, right? So we have these ZK Snarks. They're incredibly powerful technology. We can prove almost any statement that you can represent with them. So why are we just doing cash? When I spend money to you, all I'm doing is proving I have some money and I'm not giving you more than I have. But we could do so much more. We could build entire smart contract systems. We could have user-defined assets. We could build all kinds of things that are well beyond what's being done today. And those may or may not end up as part of Zcash, but we should think about them and we should decide what the future for this technology is. So uh, the last thing I want to mention is that, well, these are my ideas of the, the kinds of things we should be thinking about where we could go next. It's not entirely up to me. We have a governance panel that just made a vote. We don't have the results of that vote, at least as of right this second, that's gonna be picking two more board members. And the board is gonna be picking a direction where we're ramping up really fast. It's gonna be picking a direction for the foundation, at least, that determines a lot of the uh, directions that this research will go and where Zcash will go in the future. So I just wanna say that you know, this community has been great and I'm really looking forward to seeing where we can go next from this, from this space we're in right now. So thank you very much.